Let's start. So welcome to this 37th edition of Europe Calling. Europe Calling is an innovative way to bring citizens as well as media and other decision makers in touch with those who take decisions in Europe. Uh, I'm honored by three high level guests. Uh, to start with uh, Dr. Elke Koenig, she is the head of the single supervisor, uh, the single resolution board, which is the newly created body to wind down banks or take resolution decisions. We will come to that later. Uh, and of course, uh, yep. she uh, was formerly uh, in Germany in uh, supervisory positions. Andrea Enria, he's the boss of the single supervisor, which we have created in the ECB uh, for the large banks. And uh, I have to say, I am extremely proud that I was uh, one of the two rapporteurs who created uh, this body uh, with the council and many others in the parliament. And of course, with the commission and the commission is represented by the deputy director for in the DG, uh, DG Com director general in the DG competition and responsible for state aid. And this is exactly the subject uh, we are talking about tonight. And um, well, this is a truly complicated matter. And you may um, remember that after the crisis and after the need in order to stabilize the financial system, after the outbreak of the crisis, there was one big uh, political promise. We will end the use of taxpayers' money uh, in the framework of banking. We want that private um, investors take the risk themselves and not taxpayers. Uh, since then, we have had a lot of experience. We have common supervision, we have common resolution, uh, but we still had some new cases of state aid in the banking sector, which has sparked a lot of public debate, mainly in the finance community in a wider sense. So uh, in this edition, we want to talk about that experience. Why were there no new cases? Why were so few cases le led into orderly resolution? And uh, why were there new uh, eight cases approved? And any need to change anything with this regime? So uh, myself, I'm the coordinator of the Green Group in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. And um, I would like to say that this event here is mainly to ask questions rather than only debate between us. So therefore, as normal in Europe calling, we will listen first uh, to those who have the knowledge, and then it's your turn to ask questions. Everything is recorded, and afterwards you can also watch it uh, on the web, so you should know that this is the case. And uh, of course, if you raise your voice, please say where you are from, and what your background is if you represent anyone so that everything is transparent as it should be in Europe and normally is. So uh, I would like to ask my staff now to show a slide, short slide to understand a bit better what we talk about. Yes, uh, so it is the issue of um, banking resolution and banking state aid decisions is a highly complex matter. And uh, that makes the whole debate a bit complicated. So if a bank faces capital needs, you can see it at the bottom, there, there may well be decision, uh, solutions to find money uh, by private actors. So if that's such a decision by a private uh, um, uh, uh, investor is taken, this is no aid, it is not, has nothing to do with banking resolution. And this is basically falls outside of what we talk about. If there is a solution which involves public money, then the first uh, test is whether the, the whole ba the bank and the aid um, is in the field of a normal state aid decision. And then basically, the commission, and I'm sure the commission will say more about this, has to decide uh, whether the aid given 
is in accordance, we are here now, with market terms. So only if the money is given uh, according to a so-called private investor test, this can be approved. And this was actually, then uh, it is not illegal state aid, but approved state aid. And this was, for instance, the case with the North LB, but also uh, with um, several, two other uh, banks. If um, the whole regime falls under the BRRD, so the banking, the new rules of the European Union that for banking recovery and resolution, then uh, the big question is, is the bank likely to fa failing or likely to fail? If it is uh, failing or likely to fail, then the question is, is resolution in the public interest? If this decision, which is a decision by the SRB, represented by Elke König, if this is the case, uh, that this is uh, in the public interest, then we are with a potential resolution under the BRRD rules. The SRB becomes active, this is the case of the Banco Popular. When there is no public interest seen uh, for the resolution, then uh, this can still lead to a wind down of the respective bank under national law. Then we are, for instance, in the case of the two Italian banks, Veneto uh, uh, and uh, also Banco Popular di Vincenza. Uh, on the other hand, if a struggling bank is um, likely to fail, uh, and uh, this is not the case, so is not likely to fail, then there is under the BRRD four conditions to be met. The bank has to be solvent, the bank um, public measures have to be temporary in nature, there must be serious disturbance in the economy, and fourth, all incurred or likely future losses um, have to be covered by private means, then it is possible to have a, uh, what we call a precautionary recapitalization. This is uh, the famous case of the Banco di Pasci di Siena. No bail-in is in this case required. And this is a, a simple version of what is uh, uh, what cases we have seen so far in the different new forms of support given. If anything is fundamentally flawed, I'm sure our experts will correct me immediately, but it is uh, already messy enough, and, will, and this graph will clearly fall under the category of one of the weirder pieces of graphs in the European uh, integration process. Uh, so, Therefore, the starting point for any of these cases to bring some order is, and that's why I want to start with Andrea, we have new banks which somehow uh, faces, face capital needs. So despite that, we are trying to supervise them more narrowly. So from your perspective, Andrea, how did we get to these new cases of struggling banks? Although we have been trying our best to avoid just that situation. Please, Andrea. Well, thank you very much. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be in this discussion tonight. It's my first time in a webinar, so I'm very looking forward to it. Um, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Now, uh, first of all, let me say that the main objective of the regulatory reforms we've been going through and of the uh, new supervision regulatory framework that we have set up with the Banking Union is not actually to prevent each and every bank from uh, going bust, from failing. Uh, rather, the objective was to reduce the likelihood of a bank to fail and to contain the impact when a bank is, uh, is to fail. And let me just make a, a few uh, preliminary remarks here. I mean, if you, if you rewind uh, to the uh, time of the crisis, we had uh, uh, banks that were requested to keep uh, uh, relatively low levels of capital. There were basically no instruments that were kept in the liability structure of banks that could be absorbing losses in case of crisis. And there was no uh, liquidity requirements uh, neither in international standards, not in European legislation. All the reforms had put uh, uh, 
a much stronger requirements as end banks are now uh, much more uh, robust in terms of their capital position, their liquidity position, and also the loss absorbing capacity that they've been building in. Um, there was no great preparation for crisis events. Uh, so banks basically were not uh, doing any, any, any preparation. And this meant that when the crisis hit, uh, let's say in the weekend, governments had no choice but to bail out banks, basically. Uh, now we are asking banks, uh, uh, both the, the, the ECB and the Single Resolution Board, to prepare, to prepare the so-called uh, recovery and resolution plan. Uh, so, and there has been much progress in this area as well. Another point that I want to stress is also that, uh, because I, it was for me a particularly, let's say, uh, disappointing feature of what happened during the crisis, uh, there was uh, um, notwithstanding a lot of preparation and around understandings, agreements between authorities, there was no really effective and strong cooperation between authorities. And sometimes the lack of cooperation led banking groups to be split uh, along national lines uh, just to make them uh, uh, their crisis manageable with national tools. Now we have with the banking union large cross-border groups which are expected to probably create a public interest and then go under resolution that are managed uh, through um, a process which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, under close cooperation and the cooperation between the ECB and the SRB. In all the cases that you already mentioned, Sven has been always uh, excellent, I must say. Uh, now, let me go uh, more in the details of your questions. I mean, why are we having still bank failing? And uh, well, in the, in the past five years, the number of banks which have experienced a deep crisis has been very limited. Uh, to give some perspective, currently, we, we um, say supervise, I think, 117 banks who have always been in the ballpark around 120. And in the last five years, we have had uh, six banks that have been determined as failing or likely to fail. Uh, now, again, this is a relatively small number, uh, but the effectiveness of supervision is not in my view in the number of banks that fail, but on the ability to spot the problem in time and the pressure on the banks to address it. And, uh, and uh, um, I, I think that in all these cases we can document, I will not go, of course, into specific cases, that there was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, pressure put to the supervisors uh, that the, and that the problems were spotted quite ahead of time. The only case maybe that I would mention to exception to this is the uh, ABLV case, in which uh, the failure of the bank was determined by a decision of the uh, US authorities uh, uh, that identified a, a money laundering issue actually, uh, in, in relation to the bank, which triggered the liquidity problem. At the time. But in the other cases, let's say there was a lot of uh, prior action taken by the ECB. And in practice, the way in which we determine the failure of life to fail, to explain to you how we, we work, um, we organize. Uh, the work in, in a sort of, uh, uh, we have developed an internal crisis management framework, uh, the so-called SSM emergency action plan. This is a very structured set of uh, escalation uh, steps in an escalation process, um, which is linked to a number of in indicators uh, that we use, uh, referring to the uh, solvency position of the bank, the liquidity position of the bank, and these uh, escalation procedures, which is in three stages, is also linked to an increased uh, engagement with uh, uh, other authorities, in cooperation with other authorities. For instance, with the uh, with the single uh, with the single resolution, uh, the single resolution board. So um, uh, the the way in which we operate, uh, we, we we look at the indicators that are and the, the criteria which are defined by the European Banking Authority which has listed uh, some objective elements that we should uh, check. Uh, but of course, this is not a, an assessment which can be, um, you know, uh, uh, crystallized in a sort of uh, mechanistic uh, approach. We always have to uh, actually um, exercise judgment. So for instance, also in our escalation process, sometimes we have uh, uh, so, so sort of uh, false positive, so uh, we don't trigger the process because notwithstanding some indicators are triggered, we think that the bank is still, is still 
is still uh, viable. And so we try to take into account all the all the circumstances. And when uh, uh, when uh, we pull the trigger on the thing or like to fail, of course we need to have good cooperation with the resolution authorities because basically we pass the baton to our to our colleagues in resolution and. Uh, uh, and as I said, uh, with the SRB, there is strong involvement and strong cooperation. So that when the a bank is uh, is uh, going under resolution, this process is very smooth. Uh, when the um, national liquidation procedures are triggered, the situation is a bit uh, messier. And uh, I would say that there is a little bit of a, a Babel Tower of uh, national laws, insolvency procedures, and national practices, which is not always easy to deal with. But maybe we will get to that in the second part of our of our discussion. So I would leave it here. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And then let's move uh, the cases. So one you had declared uh, or signed six banks as failing or likely to fail. In this moment, you come in, Elke. You get your customers. So what did you do with your customers? So, um, and uh, how comes, and that is what many citizens, of course, uh, will ask, uh, how comes that we only have seen one uh, winding down or takeover in the framework uh, of the BRRD? Uh, so why, what do you do with uh, those Enri Andrea sends to you? So, uh, please. Okay, thank you. And first of all, thank you for discussing the topic, though I'm not sure whether eight in the evening is the right time to do so, but that's something else. And I feel a bit reminded there was another graph you did quite some years ago about does it ever work? So looking at the entire framework of BRD and seeing all the steps we have to take, and I think we can now say, yes, it did, because at least in the case of Banco Popular, we proved that the framework works. But let me go one step back. And I think it's perfectly understood that this is a fairly, I wouldn't say confusing, but complex topic. First and foremost, if a bank gets into troubled water and into difficulty, we cannot hinder anyone to put money into the institution. So it's a bit like at home, if you find someone who plugs your hole, fine. Some others might think it doesn't make too much sense, but fine. So this is what you have on your side in saying there's a private investor to go in, and then you are outside our framework. If, and there I would probably have drafted it myself a bit different, if the bank is failing to, or likely to fail, so the ECB has concluded the bank is failing, sends this assessment to us, we concur with the assessment. Well, in that case, what we have to do is what we call the so-called public, in, uh, public interest assessment. So the bank is failing or likely to fail, we decide there are no supervisory or private sector measures that can restore the bank. But then the third one is to decide whether it is necessary in the public interest to really resolve the bank with the tools we have or whether the bank should be wound up under normal national insolvency procedures. And to be fair, the criteria we are using for public interest assessment is actually to say, does the bank have critical functions for the financial system in this member state? Would the failure of this bank cause financial stability concern in a country? Only then the resolution framework kicks in. We take over as a, I think the simplest way to say, as a insolvency administrator with very far reaching powers, which then of course will be checked afterwards in a judicial process. In all other cases, we would conclude that yes, the bank is failing or likely to fail, but it can be wound up like each and every other a company or entity under national insolvency procedures. And here, 
Andrea has already alluded to, starts a bit the confusion. We had Banco Popular, which was the fifth largest bank in Spain, had a 120 billion plus balance sheet. And of course, we concluded the bank, it's in the public interest to resolve the bank. We used our framework. The bank was sold. I've always said we were also lucky because there was a willing buyer for this bank. And the bank could be resolved without any impact on financial stability and without any taxpayer money involved because it was shareholders and bondholders, certain bondholders that were actually losing money. Ordinary depositors were not affected. Then there were in total four cases in which we decided no, it's not in the public interest. It were the two Venetian banks you mentioned, but also two banks, small banks in Latvia, now smallest relative. One of those banks was the fourth largest bank in Latvia, while the Venetian banks were only ranking at the end of round about 10. In the Venetian cases then, and this was when the commission kicked in, the government decided in insolvency to give aid to the bank, so to manage the insolvency. In the two other cases, it was a just a regular insolvency procedure. Where does now come in what you have on your other side? And that's something which probably is important to say. The framework we came, you mentioned it before, out of the world of saying never ever taxpayers money again. So basically, if state aid is involved, the bank is automatically deemed failing or likely to fail. But clearly not always when public money is involved is this state aid. And this is probably something which Carlos can by far better explain than I can. And I would stop here. We have definitely a chance to go into more detail later. Yes, so this was a perfect handover to DG Competition. Uh, to the you see, we are working well together. Oh yes, I uh, was now noting this generally. Uh, the, um, uh, the point is, uh, beyond that, if you want to ask questions uh, uh, afterwards, please uh, use the green hand uh, button or type in your questions in writing and I will read them later. But now first, uh, uh, Carles Esteva Mosso, sorry for my bad Catalan. And uh, uh, so uh, Elke prepared already the ground. So uh, we had banks which uh, received public money, which you regarded not as state aid or as state aid, which is in accordance with the so-called state aid guidelines uh, for the banking sector. Please explain. Perfect. First of all, good evening, and thanks not only for inviting me, but for organizing this uh, webinar. As, as your slides show, this is a complex matter with a, a number of overlapping institutions, and it's good that we have this opportunity to, to explain and to avoid sometimes uh, misunderstandings that may, may arise here. Um, the, the basic goal of a state aid control is, is to avoid distortions of, uh, of competition, the distortions that would be involved in any in any support uh, to a bank with relation to to the others and since the beginning of the crisis what the commission has been doing is assessing uh, all public support to banks to ensure that aid is the the minimum necessary and therefore the distortion of competition the minimum possible uh, while at the same time ensuring the financial stability and as you said well uh, we do that applying a, a uh, a legal framework that is described in this banking communication from 2013 uh, that also ensures that we treat all cases equally um, no matter what is the member state involved. And maybe a, a first point to, to clarify is the one that just Elke mentioned is that not all public support is necessarily considered a state aid because we are bound by a very important principle of the, of the treaty which is the principle of neutrality. The Commission cannot make distinctions between public and private ownership, 
of banks. Uh, and therefore, we need to treat public investors in the same way that we would treat private ones. Therefore, if a public investor is investing in a bank in the same conditions that a private one would do, then we are not in front of the state aids. Now, how we assess this? Well, there are different ways to assess if a public investor intervenes under the same conditions that a private one, together with a private one, we would normally identify this as a, a situation where, where a private investor would have done the same. We can also look in cases where a private a public investors uh, um, intervene alone. In that case, we would normally try to examine benchmarks that would allow us to identify whether this public investor is intervening in the same conditions that a private one would do. If we are talking, for instance, of a state guarantee, we would examine that this guarantee is remunerated at the same uh, rate that a private investor would require for uh, similar types of risks. And if we are talking about uh, a capital uh, injection, we will examine uh, that uh, this capital injection would lead to a, a profitability that is similar to the one that a private investor uh, would, would have uh, requested in, in, in a similar situation. So when we are in front of these situations, uh, we, we are not uh, considering a, a, a state aid uh, uh, there. Uh, we can nevertheless adopt the decision that confirms that there is no state aid in this situation. And as you have mentioned, this is what we did in the, in the case of North LB. Now, we could also be confronted to situations where public investors intervene under conditions that a, a private one would have not done so. In that case, of course, we will analyze the state aid, but that doesn't mean that every time that a public investor intervenes, uh, the state aid cannot be approved. Uh, as your slides show, there are some circumstances where nevertheless, state aids could still be deemed uh, compatible. Uh, you've mentioned, for instance, the situation of precautionary recapitalizations, where under a number of strict conditions, we could accept a state aid to be compatible. And here, let me correct one point of your slide. You said that in this situation, no bail-in is required. Uh, from the point of view of state aids, we will require what we call burden sharing, which is exactly the same thing that you have mentioned in your slide with regards to, to liquidation aid. Mm -hmm. And liquidation aid is the other type of state aid that uh, we could consider compatible. In this case, of course, this is an aid that leads to the exit of the market of, a, of an entity that was not viable and therefore also contributes to restore the, the condition of competitions in this sector. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. I think this was already highly challenging because uh, it is a, a complex matter. Uh, however, um, could you, because obviously the debate around public money, this is really your decision. Could you try to explain a bit more systematically which cases you approved for what reasons uh, and, uh, and why in the end the public impression is, in the end, everybody finds a way who wants to to, grant, to give new public money into a struggling bank. So this is the public perception. Can you explain why for the different types of uh, cases, you, you in the end came to a positive decision? So this is, I think, what many people are confused about. Well, first of all, let me be clear that uh, here we are not in a situation where we have full discretion to decide which cases we approve and which cases we don't. We operate within uh, a legal framework uh, that for the area of state aids uh, is not uh, exclusively uh, applicable to the banking sector. It's a, it's a framework that goes beyond the banking sector and that is, uh, uh, has been developed over the years uh, also by, by the jurisprudence of the, of the European courts. And uh, to start maybe with the first uh, type of situation that I described, uh, the one where a public uh, 
uh, intervention may not involve state aid. Uh, this is uh, uh, based, as I said, on the principle of neutrality of the treaty. It comes directly as a corollary from the fact that the European uh, Treaty sets uh, uh, a principle where there is no preference towards public or private uh, ownership uh, of companies. And the court has developed uh, uh, this principle. And one of the corollaries of this principle is that when we assess the state aid, we need to treat public and private operators uh, equally. And that's why before establishing whether there is aid, we need to see whether a public operator will intervene in the market in the same conditions than the private one would have uh, would have done so. So when we are in front of these situations, uh, and I've described before a bit how we would conduct this analysis, uh, it's not a matter of approving or disapproving the aid. It's simply a matter that we cannot even establish that there is aid. And the burden of proof would be on the Commission, and we would need to defend in front of the court that uh, this intervention uh, has been conducted on something that is different from, from market terms. So when, as a result of all the analysis that I've described before, we identify that a private, uh, that a public investor is intervening on the same conditions as a private one, then we are simply constating that there is no aid and that the operation can can go ahead. So these decisions are not even decisions of approving the aid, are simply decisions establishing that in this situation there is no aid and a public uh, investor uh, can increase the capital of the bank or grant guarantees remunerated at, at market rates, basically. Then I describe the situations where there is aid. Huh? Uh, and the two situations are also foreseen on the uh, PLRD. One is uh, precautionary uh, recapitalization. Uh, this is a type of uh, recapitalization that is only available for, uh, for solvent banks. It would not be uh, possible through this recapitalization to cover uh, already incur losses. Uh, and in this situation, the Commission would require uh, first that the bank uh, becomes uh, viable in the future, that uh, there is a restructuring plan, if necessary, that ensures viability. In second hand, if this leads to distortions of competition, it will require measures that reduce these distortions. For instance, divesting uh, some assets in, in, in markets where this bank has an important position. And finally, we would uh, uh, require also, as I mentioned before, that there is a degree of burden sharing, that is, that uh, uh, shareholders and subordinated debt holders contribute also uh, to, the, uh, to the recapitalization and that not all the burden is, uh, is by, the, by the state. Uh, this is one situation, as I said, foreseen by the PRRD. And the second situation that I've mentioned, where aid can be approved, uh, this is a situation where a bank uh, will exit the market. And we think that in certain situations, liquidation aid would facilitate this exiting of the market. In this case, we are talking about not viable entities. Uh, so what we need to establish is that at the end of the process, this entity will uh, stop operating. Uh, but again, we will also require in this situation a, a degree of burden sharing to ensure that not all the board is, is, is carried by, by the state. So those are the, the basic uh, situations where we have uh, in the past uh, accepted uh, uh, that uh, public support is still granted to banks as foreseen by the, by the legal framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, before I start asking more questions or even and read uh, the ones uh, signaled by the citizens, I would like to ask you now, and again in the same order, from your perspective and your experience after some years and a whole number of cases, do you see need to change the rules of this game? So uh, either on the side of um, 
the judgments, what is aid, what is not aid, what is harmful, uh, illegal aid and what is not illegal aid, and as well as uh, the legislative framework and the institutional framework under which we are operating. So, Andrea, after these uh, some years now with this, is there a need for change? And if so, what? Yes, as I was uh, hinting before, uh, in my view, the main issue now uh, lies with the uh, in the liquidation area. I mean, in a sense, uh, the the agreement be behind the legislation that we have in place now was that uh, if a bank is not, uh, let's say, does not raise a, a public interest at the European level, then I mean, there is no problem. It goes into the national liquidation procedures, and it will exit the market according to the. Uh, to the rules in that uh, in that uh, specific uh, member state. Uh, now, uh, what we hadn't really foreseen at the time is that uh, uh, with the, we have such a wide range of practices at the national level, ranging from uh, uh, member states where a bank would go into a, a, an ordinary liquidation as any other corporate, so without any protection for uh, for um, let's say allowing depositors, uh, also not uh, uh, insure depositors, let's say, to, uh, to manage uh, 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 smoothly their, 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 their own, their, 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 their holdings. Um, and then you go to member states where you have administrative procedures for liquidation, which are run out, outside the ordinary liquidation procedures, and uh, which allow for a smoother exit. And then you have even cases in which, as uh, Carlos was saying, uh, you can also have liquidation aid in case of, uh, in case of uh, banks exiting uh, the market. You also have different uh, uh, ways in which deposit guarantee schemes can intervene to support the bank, either prior to actually a possible failure, to prevent the failure, or also in the, in the, in the, in the let's say, uh, during the, uh, the the crisis, and then you have um, uh, let's say also the the um, uh, so uh, you have also institutional protection schemes in some cases. So private schemes between uh, cooperative banks or savings banks, which also perform according to very different uh, to very different uh, uh, frameworks. Finally, last but not least, also the way in which you actually can withdraw the license of a bank is very different. And, and, and we are responsible for withdrawing the license. And we found cases in which, for instance, uh, uh, national courts rejected the insolvency of the bank and put us in a very difficult position. So there were banks that actually were declared failure or like to fail. And after uh, almost two years, they were still holding a license because it was difficult for us to withdraw the license. So. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, we think that there is uh, there are, that there is now significant experience that support uh, moving to uh, let's say moving to a much more uh, uh, harmonized framework also for liquidation of banks. As I mentioned before, five of, out of the six banks that we declared failure or like to fail actually went under national liquidation in very different uh, conditions. And uh, personally, I think that uh, the the, the uh, the schemes that are applied in the United States uh, should uh, serve uh, uh, as a model for us. There you have uh, a, basically uh, the, deposit, the, 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 the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, um, which is uh, uh, stepping in the banks using the so-called purchase and assumption uh, mechanism. So basically they take control of the failing bank and then through an administrative procedure, they managed to sell assets and liabilities uh, through competitive processes with the result that basically the customer in most cases don't even notice that the bank is exiting the market. Depositors continue operating with the bank. Uh, borrowers keep, uh, let's say, paying their, their interest and, and principal uh, and, uh, and, and eventually the, 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 uh, the assets and liabilities and the branches are usually sold to other banks. The interesting thing is also that having this process managed at the federal level in the US allows uh, that uh, banking crisis, for instance, in Puerto Rico have been managed by selling assets and liabilities of banks uh, to other banks coming from other states in the United States, which helped uh, having a so-called uh, 
private risk sharing function, no? so that basically a shock hitting one state in the US can be spread through the banking sector also to other states. Well, what we have seen here in, uh, in, in several member states, in, in Greece, uh, in, uh, in Ireland, in Portugal, in Spain, is that the shock hitting banks in one country generally tend to, you know, uh, activate what has been uh, characterized as the doom loop between the banks and the sovereign. So I think that uh, uh, that uh, these, uh, uh, this would help a lot moving to that type of scheme, more European, more harmonized, and ideally also manage more at the uh, at the European uh, at the European level. And uh, yeah, I think that that's uh, that's the main uh, the main comment uh, I would have. You, you mentioned also. Um, I mean, I'm still. Uh, struggling a bit with this, but I, I think it's uh, it's right. I mean, all what uh, Carlos mentioned about the state aid intervention is absolutely correct. Uh, there is this gap with perceptions of the general public that I think we need to find a way to fill some way or another, because this perception that uh, there was a promise not to have uh, state aid anymore, uh, to have state support bailout of banks anymore, seems to be not really, uh, really, uh, uh, well understood by the general public. So I very much welcome this type of initiative that allow to explain, but maybe we should reflect also more broadly on how to engage better in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this process of uh, support in case of crisis. Thank you. Mr. Koenig. Let me try to build a bit on what uh... Andrea said, but get one, go one step back. And I think I understand this feeling of no more taxpayers' money, and then you see very different solutions in different cases. But I think everyone needs to also understand that in 2017, for example, we had the case of precautionary capitalization. We had a resolution case. We had two cases that went into national insolvency with than liquidation aid, and it was the first time testing a new framework. One of the lessons out of this was, for example, around precautionary recapitalization, which is considered to be a temporary, I would call it reassurance measure for a viable solvent bank, that afterwards there was a lot of discussion to say, do we need additional safeguards like a very acute asset quality review, which means a health check of the bank before you can move forward and the like. This is an area which I think we still need to work on. Also, the area of really aligning between BRD, SRMR, and the the banking communication that Carlos had mentioned before, so the state aid framework. There is definitely room for improvement in this area, but I would say the major really step forward is indeed what Andrea mentioned. We have to see that we have a European system for bank resolution, but if resolution is not the right solution, you move into 19 plus different national insolvency systems, and partially you even move into kind of a difficulty to bridge because failing or likely to fail is in most countries not the criteria for an insolvency procedure. So you get into a bit a gray area in between, as we had seen in a number of cases. Secondly, you clearly are faced with different procedures, as Andrea has already explained, partially judicial procedures, partially administrative procedures, and with a system which I think is even hard to understand, licensing is something that has to come and license withdrawal can only come for all banking union banks from the SSM, so the ECB, but the law is national. So the ECB is applying 19 different laws to this, leading to a situation which you can find it weird 
or I find it rather scary, where a bank has still a license, so the bank is in insolvency. I would like to see that we link failing or likely to fish a decision with license withdrawal. It would solve at least a number of problems. The second part is clearly, was also mentioned, that we have a harmonized deposit guarantee system, but harmonized in form of a uh, directive means with a number of national varieties. So in some member states, there is a voluntary intervention. In other member states, it's just a mere pay box in the case of, uh, of uh, depositors not being served otherwise. We have some member states that have also on top a private deposit guarantee system which can intervene. And I think here it would be helpful in particularly for the question of what could be a preventive decision by a deposit guarantee system to clarify what a deposit guarantee system is allowed to do. And then I would say it doesn't even mean it's state aid anymore more because it's clearly within their remit and would not. And the as mentioned before, the FDIC, so, so the U.S. Deposit Guarantee System, has over years developed a model where they say they intervene on a least cost basis. So they take the cheapest possible intervention to protect depositors. And I think here we need more harmonization in Europe too. And by the way, for me, the question of insolvency and perhaps even at one point a European administrative insolv bank liquidation framework and the question of deposit guarantee go hand in hand because the, probably the insolvency procedure is the one that best defines the cost for the deposit guarantee system. So I think in this area we need to move forward but we need also to be fair. We have only started with all of this five years ago. So there's also a bit of step-by-step -step moving. Yes, so thanks uh, for sharing this. And now the question goes directly to DG Comp. So what do you think needs, if any, to change when we look at the regime? Uh, well, I think the points that have just been mentioned, that the discrepancy of uh, the resolution or liquidation systems at national level and uh, different ways in which DGSs can intervene at the national level are, are important issues in this debate that uh, has just started on how to deal with that is an important one. This, however, goes well beyond the area of, of, of state aid control. In the area of states, as I explained, our framework is, uh, is described in this banking communication of 2013. It's, uh, it's, um, it's a tool that has uh, served us well uh, during, during the crisis, and uh, those principles uh, have been uh, also very adaptable to the introduction of the BRRD and the new, and the new uh, resolution and supervisory uh, procedures. So I, I, I don't think there is an urgency uh, to really revamp the, the banking communication. I think we have to have in mind that while the banking sector has uh, uh, certainly improved substantially since the crisis, uh, uh, we still have some pockets of uh, vulnerability here and there. Uh, we still see an important uh, percentage of non-performing loans in, 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 in some uh, uh, banking markets, uh, we still see, uh, probably also as a, as a tale of the crisis, this uh, situation with uh, very low uh, rates and therefore uh, relatively low profitability of banks. Uh, um, and at the same time, we see that the banking union is still evolving. We see, for instance, uh, that banks are still building up their stocks of uh, uh, of MREL and, uh, and uh, of other uh, product good facilitated uh, bail-ins. So uh, we are not yet in the steady state, let's say, of the, 
of the banking union and and, and dealing uh, under the perspective of the state aids uh, with different rules that the ones that we have applied during the crisis may lead to an equal treatment across across member states. So while there's still certainly a lot to learn in the way the three authorities uh, interact, and we've been discussing that among us, uh, I don't think there is a, an urgent need to revise the, the basic principles that we've been applying to, to state aid control in, in this area. And may I ask whether I understood correctly, do you think the state aid um, the communication for the banking area should be revised in the near future or not? No, no, I think these principles have worked uh, uh, well uh, during the crisis period, uh, before the BRD and also after it. So at this stage, I don't see that there is a, a, a major need to, to reform. Mm -hmm. If I may ask one follow-up on this, one could argue that um, basically the conditions for bail-in are quite different when something is being done under the framework of BRRD in comparison to when things are being done under the framework of the state aid communication for banks. Is this difference in the depth of bail-in, so on the one hand, under the BRRD, potentially involving uh, senior bondholders and even uh, large depositors, while when it comes to um, bail-in under the state aid communication, limited to junior bonds and equity, is this difference uh, well justified? Because this is basically a difference which uh, was uh, put into law only with, with the BRRD coming into force, while, while as you were saying, the bait, uh, state communication was from before the BRRD and the SRB uh, was actually in existence. So do you think these two different regimes, in a way, uh, and different level of bail-in is justified. Well, I think this issue should not be looked in isolation. I think this is part of a broader debate that uh, links to what uh, uh, both uh, Andre and Ria and Anelke Konek have been discussing, that is the need uh, to deal with the different frameworks for liquidation at the national level, uh, and uh, in, in the context of resolving this issue, I think the bail-in uh, provisions can be discussed, but uh, I don't think this has to be discussed in isolation only from the point of view of a state aid control. Okay, I won't torture you any longer on this one, uh, but um, I would like to read the first questions which arrived here. Uh, this time, because perhaps the prominence and expertise of the participants, people are extremely shy to ask to speak directly to us. You still have the possibility to use the green hand function. Uh, I will read now uh, the first questions which uh, arrived here. So the first one is from Hans Florian Heuer. He is representing, uh, or he was representing, the GLS Bank, which is an ethical bank uh, based in Germany, and um, uh, he, he has now retired. He's asking the following. Rescuing bank uh, with uh, m money seems to be a one-screw solution, which is not appropriate for the complexity of the problem. By turning screws on a combustion engine, you never get a hybrid electric vehicle. Could this uh, point below be a step forward to a solution? And now comes the potential solution from his perspective. A separation of the banks into those that secure payment transactions and are oriented towards the common good, providing borrowing sustainable loans is required. These should work transparently on the non-profit cost-recovering base 
with societal risk insurance. This will shift the idea of bank rescue from the wrong to the right. So basically his point is, you might remember the banking structural reform debate we had in the, in Europe to say there should be some banks which de facto have a public function. They should have a stronger guarantee than today, while others who do not fulfill his criteria uh, should be under stronger screw. This is what I understand. So a second person, and I will put them together, is uh, Jack Schickler from MLEX. For the resolution framework to be credible, markets must, must be convinced banks will not receive taxpayers' money outside market norms. The Nord LB decision assumes 7% return on equity in a market where the average is zero for a bank without systemic functions. Does this deliver market credibility? Yeah. These are two questions for to to start with. And uh, please, um, who wants to start? Uh, well, on the banking separation question, this is perhaps also interesting uh, from a wider perspective for Andrea. So, do you think this is a good idea, or do you think this is a good bad idea? Do you think? help us solve that problem? Well, I mean, this is a personal view, of course. Uh, I don't think there is, I know actually right, that there is a strong uh, ECB position on the on the matter. But uh, let's say when the Likener report was, uh, was published uh, a, a few years ago, uh, I was basically supportive. So having some sort of uh, uh, relatively mild structural uh, segregation of of, uh, of functions to prevent that uh, let's say some uh, capital market activities are easily let's say financed with deposit taking. I think uh, is uh, is something that is also in line with the lessons from the crisis. Having a, a precise and a neat separation between uh, let's say. Uh, good banks uh, serving the com local communities and being under public guarantees and uh, and uh, complex uh, global uh, banks operating capital markets not under the the, uh, the 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 safety net. I think is uh, if you look back to the experience of the crisis, I mean the major problems in, in public budgets actually eventually have been caused by uh, banks that have done in most cases uh, uh, residential uh, real estate or commercial real estate uh, uh, lending, uh, the cajas in, in, in Spain uh, probably would have been classified as uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, family banks uh, providing uh, uh, support to local communities, but eventually they got engaged into very uh, risky business uh, uh, in the real estate market in particular. When they went under, let's say there was a major uh, systemic problem for the, uh, for, the, for the overall sector. So it's very difficult to, uh, to distinguish. I think we need to have a, a clear uh, articulation of the safety net. And I think that all in all, let's say the BRRB sets the stage um, more or less, uh, more or less, uh, more or less right, uh, in a sense, and uh, and it allows, of course, to provide uh, higher guarantees, uh, you not know, for banks which are relying more on uh, retail deposits. So the retail depositors, of course, are benefiting of a of a of a, of a stronger of a stronger coverage than uh, than uh, than uh, than other type of uh, other type of saver. So. I think all in all the, the, the setup is uh, is relatively good. Although again, as I said before, I I was uh, supporting of the proposals in the in the Likan report uh, to make some sort of uh, you know uh, more uh, uh, let's say um, requirements, some sort of structural segregation that doesn't allow basically some capital market activities to be extensively financed. Uh, uh, through deposit taking, I think that would have been uh, uh, enhancing the resilience of the of the banking sector. On the northern day, I would leave the. Uh, I think the answer is more for uh, for Carles to to take over. Uh, 
I mean, I, I can just say what we do as supervisor when we assess these type of cases. Um, basically, when we look at the, the business plan, uh, we look at whether the business plan is uh, sustainable from a supervisory perspective. So in the case of Northern Day, so if the project was ensuring also under relatively stress conditions, relatively adverse conditions, uh, would have ensured that uh, the bank uh, would stay in line with the, uh, with the, with the capital uh, requirements and buffers. So that's our main, our main uh, purpose and uh, that's what we looked at and we interact very much and cooperate very much with DG Competition in terms of uh, interlinking uh, two different uh, perspectives on the same uh, business plan, basically. Mm -hmm. Elke, do you want to, to comment on these two questions? Briefly, I think like Andrea, when the Likan report came out, I thought it was a very smart and a very detailed and profound analysis. But to some extent, I think the situation has evolved and moved forward. And when I look at our work in resolution planning, partially ideas that were addressed in the Likan report are addressed by us in considering what are functions of a bank that in resolution need to be maintained and which parts would not be maintained. The problem is, and there I have a problem with Mr. Hoyer's assessment, I would like Andrea to take it a bit in brackets, between the good ones and the bad ones. Probably the good ones are not always good and the bad ones are not always bad. So for me, the situation would more be for all banks, and it, it needs to be clear that if something goes terribly wrong, then it's first for the equity holder to bear the losses, then junior bond holders, and then you go down the line and you protect the covered deposits and you make it very clear that everyone is treated the same way. So not you get along here and the other one is a bit the poor one who got bailed in. I think therefore, for me, the resolution framework, and to be very clear and to be very transparent, there is on which I would focus to make sure that banks are, in principle, resolvable. Charles, mm -hmm. yes, let me let me focus on the on the second on the second question, and here is one area where we cooperated uh, closely with uh, with Andrea and the SSM. And uh, certainly the analysis from their perspective of the business plan is something that we, we take very much into account in our in our own analysis. But as I explained before, in that in this type of situations, what we need to establish is that a, a private investor would have uh, invested in, in the same conditions than the public uh, would would do. Uh, and, and here our benchmark cannot be the current profitability of the banking sector our benchmark has to be the same one that a private investor would use. That is uh, where this bank will be in terms of profitability after the restructuring has taken place and what would be the internal rate of return at, at that moment. And what we saw in this uh, case, without going too much into the details, but I think it's important to note that this is a bank with a business plan that uh, foresees a, a very important restructuring. Uh, the idea is to reduce uh, the balance sheet by around one third, exiting uh, the most uh, uh, risky areas of, of, of business, uh, also reduce the workforce by, by, by half, uh, um, and all these uh, uh, following measures that have already been started, so where, let's say, the execution risk is, is, is limited. So in view of this, the profitability of the bank at the end of this period and the internal rate of return, uh, uh, what we concluded is that would be higher than the cost of capital and that therefore that a private investor would have also invested in, in these conditions. That's the type of analysis that we conduct in these type of cases. Hmm. Yeah, as I said once uh, already in Parliament, uh, as I grew up in Hanover uh, and I 
I'm quite regularly there. It's very hard to find anyone in Hanover who shares this analysis, but uh, we will see in a few years who was right. So um, uh, beyond that, um, I must say this uh, topic here leaves people rather silent, unusually silent for these discussions. And therefore, uh, we, we are getting closer. Ah, here's now a new question, which I will um, will put directly uh, to you. It's uh, of Alexander Weber. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's the one who is with Bloomberg. And uh, he's asking the following. How much longer will retail ownership of bank bonds and equity complicate the functioning of the resolution framework? Um, do the Commission, SRB or ECB, have an idea how big this problem still is? Yes, so he, to explain, he is pointing to the fact that uh, some member states found it difficult to actually apply bail-in or search for solutions with bail-in because the ownership is with private individuals who might have a difficult time. We know, we remember perhaps well uh, one, one big debate about a suicide in Italy which was uh, thought to, to be triggered by such a bail-in decision. And, uh, and this is uh, basically what he is pointing to. And I would like to use that uh, round of questions to uh, put one of my own and the, uh, which is um, mm, the commission is linking its state aid decisions to restructuring plans so uh, in the case of not lb when it came to the restructuring plan of 2012 the objectives were not met so basically already then there was uh, new public money uh, then the profitability which was expected was not appearing and now we have the same bank as a new customer in this uh, whole affair. So, uh, what, so many people ask themselves why did they receive green light for another recapitalization although the first uh, restructuring plan did not work out. So uh, that is the uh, yeah, but perhaps we, we, we tackle these two questions first. Perhaps uh, we go the other way around and start with Kales and then Elke and Andrea, if uh, you think so. Yeah. Well, on, on, the, on the first one, uh, as I already mentioned, um, the banking union is still evolving and, and we see uh, uh, some difficulties in, in bail-ins in, in some member states. Here, what I can say is uh, simply uh, how we have dealt with these situations from the point of view of, of state aid. Um, there have been situations where uh, 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 in uh, mis-selling of uh, some financial instruments. Uh, Thank you. In case uh, this mis-selling has taken place when uh, banks uh, have been rescued uh, we have uh, insisted that those banks are the ones that uh, would face the cost of compensating anyone that has suffered from this mis-selling but uh, in cases uh, where the bank has exited uh, the market maybe because there was uh, liquidation aid as uh, we've described before in these cases we have allowed uh, member states uh, to compensate for this uh, mis-selling, uh, but uh, under strict conditions. We have uh, 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 taken care that any schemes to compensate for this uh, mis-selling are uh, based on a proper analysis of each individual, of each individual case. Huh? And in these situations, uh, some of these uh, uh, aggravated uh, individuals that may have suffered have been properly compensated without any violation of, of our rules. I think that's a, uh, an important point to take into account that facilitates the mitigation of some of these situations that have arisen in, 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 in the past. Uh, as to the second issue, which is uh, very different, um, uh, I think every public intervention has to be assessed on its own, on its own uh, merits. 
the intervention at this uh, moment uh, is a new one from the one of 2012. And uh, what we need to do is an ex-ante assessment of the new situation on the basis of, of the plan. Uh, we cannot assume that the current plan uh, will uh, not lead to success on the basis of what happened with the, with the previous one. If we would want to challenge the current plan, as I said, we would have the burden of proof of going in front of the Court of Justice and explaining why we think that this plan will not be successful. And on the basis of what I explained before, the large uh, uh, measures in terms of restructuring, uh, the abandonment of the riskier business, and the already ongoing execution of some of these measures, we thought in the case there was no reason to contest that the current plan uh, could lead to results as presented by, by Germany. That's the situation. Each case has to be assessed on its own, on its own merits. Mm -hmm. okay. Perhaps let me uh, focus on the first question. First and foremost, from the resolution framework, it's pretty clear that we have to assess investors by their rank in hierarchy and not whether they are private uh, investors or they are uh, institutional investors. So there is no difference within a given class of investors between retail and call them institutional investors. But we also need to acknowledge, and I think Carl has already jumped on this, to say that in some, for some banking types, and in particular in some member states, there was in the past, and I'm, when I'm talking about the past, I'm talking about nearly 10 years ago, there have been even tax incentives for investors, or there has been, to some extent, investors that have been told that there have, are other instruments than deposits that just give you a bit more interest and are as safe as. Well, now, this you can consider mis-selling, you can consider that people were taken for a ride, perhaps some also believed and wanted to be taken for a ride. I've always said if something looks to be too good, uh, too good to be true, it might not be true. But this clearly, as of today, can mean an obstacle to resolvability if you come to the conclusion that the Capital instruments are held by investors where you would cause more of a problem than you solve a problem in resolution. What is the only answer to this? It means that you need over time to build up resources held in appropriate hands and to grow out of this topic sooner or later. But I've always tried to be very clear, if it comes to a resolution decision, we are not deciding by who holds the instrument, but entirely by where in the creditor hierarchy is this instrument. And I think the second question is not for me. Andrea. Yes, uh, I mean, this is a question on which I have uh, I've gone uh, public quite a lot of time, because I agreed with Mr. Weber that uh, there is a legacy issue, but this legacy cannot last forever. I mean, there is a moment yeah. in which we move to a new uh, situation in which investors know which risk they take when they invest in this type of instrument, and uh, they are then uh, subject to the same treatment. Now, um, uh, to, to be honest with you, I know a little bit of the Italian situation. No? For instance, in Italy, uh, deposit, there was a different tax treatment of depositors and bondholders in the past, which meant that banks for a long period of time were pushing their own depositors to invest into bonds to benefit of a better tax treatment when the, their holdings were in excess of a certain amount. So there was a significant amount of uh, retail savers that were actually investing in bonds just to, for, for tax reasons, basically. Now, it's clear that uh, 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 once the, the basically the status of these uh, of these uh, bonds in terms of hierarchy, you know, was uh, clarified and changed uh, according to the uh, to the BRRD, let's say this situation could not uh, last anymore. And banks, uh, in my view, should have uh, taken action, and not only in Italy but also in other member states, to inform their uh, their uh, let's say investors that. Uh, uh, the treatment of, uh, of their holdings was uh, different.
and uh, banks would have had uh, plenty of opportunities also yeah. to perform liability management exercises and offer to their investors some buybacks of all the instruments and substitute them with uh, savings deposits, for instance, if that uh, was uh, was, uh, was something that uh, uh, was meeting better the uh, preferences of, of, uh, of deposit. The problem is that banks uh, have not done so and have not done so for too long. So I think that uh, it, is, it is important that uh, uh, we say insist that they need to uh, make aware their, their, uh, their investors of the status of their liability of their investments. Uh, now, ESMA has done important progress here. For instance, they have defined uh, some of the uh, most, uh, let's say, uh, loss-absorbing instruments like uh, additional uh, tier one or tier two instruments. Now, this is a bit technical, but let's say the instruments which are first in line to take, uh, to take losses as complex instruments, which means that if you are a retail investors and tomorrow you go to your bank and you ask to buy one of these instruments, the bank should request that you uh, get independent advice, which I think is an important uh, element because investors need to understand uh, the risk they are taking. Elke was correctly mentioned in another recommendation that was in the joint report that the EBA and the ESMA uh, drafted, which is that uh, uh, resolution authorities should assess whether a, a, a very large distribution of these instruments to retail customers hampers the resolvability of the bank, which is another important point. Last but not least, the ECB proposed uh, in, the, in a recent opinion uh, to introduce a minimum investment in this, in this type of instrument. So if you want to invest into instruments that are subject to bail-in, that are very high in the hierarchy uh, and that would be, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bearing losses in case of a crisis of the bank with a high likelihood, uh, that there should be a minimum, let's say, 100,000 euros investment so that you would uh, cut out the very retail investment. This is unfortunately has been implemented, if I remember well, in the DRRD2 only as an option for member states with a lower threshold, 50,000, if I remember well, and uh, not many member states so far have applied it. So still we are in the making, but I think this problem cannot stay with us forever. And we need to make investors uh, aware that if they invest in these instruments, I mean, they, they, they are in line in, according to the hierarchy to take losses. I don't see why an investor in a, in a bond, in a Parmalat bond should take losses and an investor in a, in a bond of a failing bank should not take losses. Yeah, I would like to conclude with the last question. So, um, TG Comp, uh, Carlos, Carlos was already pretty clear. He does not think it is necessary to revise the state aid um, uh, rules. Uh, uh, so the banking communication uh, at that moment. Um, but I would quite like to know uh, whether Andrea and Elke think that there is a need for a change of the BRRD. We know that you as DG Com cannot comment on this. But do you think um, there needs to be changes to the BRRD or to uh, the SRB uh, rules? Uh, because the changes you have indicated uh, more look towards the insolvency framework on the national level, where there some harmonization might be needed, which we also discuss in the framework of the Capital Markets Union. So. Uh, but um, do you think there is a need for changes to the BRRD and uh, the SRB uh, regulation? And uh, of course, if you want to comment whether you think that the state aid rules should be changed, uh, I'm happy to listen to it, but I understand if you abstain from such comments in this uh, such a setting. But you are warmly <coughs> invited to do so. If Carlos wants to comment on the other areas as well, Please, uh, you can do it, but of course, I don't push you into it. Elke. I think I would say we have just reopened BRD and SRMR with the banking package. So I would a bit get the feeling, let it first be implemented before we reopen the bank BRD and SRMR. And honestly, I don't see so much need 
to reopen Bira DNS RMR in this core recovery resolution framework. Of course, nothing is as good that you couldn't uh, improve it, and we had some wishes which didn't come in, but I think this is not crucial for me. For me, it's really crucial that we get our arms around the question of insolvency and licensing, and not big insolvency framework for everyone. Call it bank liquidation framework. Make sure that we have a viable framework harmonized across the member states for how to liquidate a bank, how to have DTSs then interfering. So what are they allowed to do? What should they do? And I think Andrea had said, let's really take a bit of an example or try to consider what in a totally different context and with 80 years of experience our US counterparts are doing. And I think I triggered a bit the question on VRD discussion, FMR versus state aid framework also there, and I agree with Carlos, no urgency need, but to look at this entirely, to make it really consistent and not to have wrong incentives at the one or the other area. It's not my urgency procedure, but should not be forgotten either. Andrea. I mean, as I mentioned before, I think the priority, uh, as Eric has also said, is in this uh, area of, uh, of, the national, uh, of the national liquidation uh, procedures. Uh, still, as I mentioned before in my introductory remarks, uh, in my first uh, response to you, Sven, um, see, I think that there is an issue of uh, the reality of what we do and an issue of the perception of what we do. And I think we should not look only at the first, but we should look also at the, at the second. Um, so, for instance, in terms of the interaction between the, uh, the, the, the overall framework and the, and the state aid framework, I think uh, that we are able to make it work very effectively. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, in all cases, I mean, I think that we can go even much more into details today, but we can justify all the decisions which have been taken on the basis of the legislation and the practices. Still, let's say we have cases, for instance, like uh, in the case of the Veneto banks, in which you have a, a bank in which uh, uh, there is no public interest at the European level, but then there is a public interest at the national level. Uh, you have uh, then uh, liquidation aid deployed at the national level, which preserves from any bail-in, uh, let's say, uh, senior unsecured uh, uh, investors, while if the bank had gone under resolution, it would have been, uh, let's say, these investors would have been subject to bail-in, so eventually, I think that, uh, uh, again, uh, we ticked all the boxes. It's a very complex framework, very different authorities intervening at the national European level. Uh, the, the outcome sometimes is difficult to understand for, let's say, for the, uh, for the citizens. And uh, we need, uh, maybe not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, we need to try and see whether we can make it a little bit simpler and better understood by, uh, by all, uh, by all uh, stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we are approaching uh, the planned or uh, scheduled deadline. Uh, I, Carlos, if you want to make concluding remarks, it's always uh, your privilege as co uh, Commission to do so. Uh, you open and start everything in Europe, so uh, uh, if you want, please, uh, otherwise I will move uh, to conclusion. Uh, no, 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 uh, very quickly, I, as I said, uh, I don't think there is an urgency to reform uh, our current mm -hmm. rules. Everything can be improved, of course, best practices can be incorporated, lessons learned, so things can be improved, but, but I don't think there is an urgency. The principles that are there continue to be valuable. And I would agree with what Andrea is saying. I think what we need to do is really an effort of, uh, of pedagogy and trying to explain why we apply the rules the way, the way we do and to avoid uh, there are misunderstandings uh, in relation to these.
to these interventions. Mm -hmm. And this seminar certainly has contributed to this, so thank you very much. Yeah, well, to me it was a pleasure to, to listen to you and uh, I heard carefully what Elke was saying in the beginning, that this is an unusual timing for such a finance event. I also recognize that citizens are quite shy to intervene into this. I can only say that uh, this does not mean that there is uh, a lack of uh, interest or um, confusion about the matter. So therefore, um, I would like to share with you what the, PAL, what the ECON committee has voted in the framework of its annual competition report. Uh, and it reads, uh, so the parliament calls on the commission to examine swiftly the discrepancies between the rules on state aid in the area of liquidation aid and the resolution regime under the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive and to revise its banking communication on of 30th of July 2013 accordingly, including in light of recent cases taking into account the need to protect taxpayers. So therefore, if this is confirmed in the plenary next week, the Parliament will call on the Commission to do so. We will then open the discussion. Of course, it's your good right uh, to follow the Parliament or not, but uh, this is uh, uh, here uh, where we stand. Then I listened to a number of suggestions. So uh, on the one hand, there was uh, the question what to do with the differences between deposit guarantee schemes in the different member states. Some have referred to the FDIC model where we have further reaching harmonization in this and um, uh, also differences between member states, how far they intervene also on a so-called voluntary basis. So this is obviously an issue for the deposit guarantee scheme the debate, which will come anyway. It, it, the, the Commission has made a proposal. It didn't meet everywhere uh, the full um, um, enthusiasm, in particular not in our member state, uh, Elke. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, we will see what comes out of this. But uh, this is, of course, the anchor point to look at this issue. When it comes to the licensing, which was first addressed by uh, Andrea, we will see an opening of CRD and C, C, um, uh, so the Capital Requirements Directive and the Capital um, Requirements Regulation when it comes to implementing Basel. This might be a possibility for Commission, Parliament, Member States to look into the subject we're raising. When it comes to the insolvency laws, of course, uh, this is so far a national um, regime. And, uh, and uh, with the exemption of what we have under BRRD and SRB, as we, as we see here, it is um, uh, also uh, involving national level. Therefore, um, uh, the whole debate is, do we need now, as Elke just mentioned it, a bank um, liquidation framework, or is this part of a wider issue, which we are discussing in the framework of the capital markets uh, um, union, where we also, for other areas of finance, need common uh, insolvency rules and procedures. Uh, but this debate uh, also is open uh, for the Commission uh, to follow up with proposals. We know that some member states are very careful to, um, to do more harmonization or institution building. On the other hand, other member states will be very reluctant to move towards full EDIS. So uh, unless there is stronger rules on uh, 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 on insolvency in financial matters. So therefore, there might be a potential deal between these two subjects, but that is uh, uh, for the future to see. Uh, and uh, there is a shared willingness by Council, Parliament and Commission to, in, to achieve on the Capital Markets Union. So therefore, if we want to achieve this, perhaps this is a possibility to also solve the problems which have been mentioned by all of you in this area. So I hope this is a fair uh, summary of some of the ideas we, we have heard. Uh, and 
uh, I personally believe it is important to try our best, at least, to uh, avoid uh, the impression uh, that there's too little has changed when it comes to public money in, uh, in, in rescuing banks. But I will abstain uh, from any more comments at that stage and wish you a good night and thank you for the participation. I'm sure more people will watch what we have been discussing and uh, I, I'm looking forward to working with you as in the past. Bye bye and let's do our best uh, to keep the Europe, European boat moving forward. Bye bye. Bye bye. All the best.